What? Ho Chi Minh did not write the famous 1919 Revendication du Peuple Animate, the demands of the enemy's people alone. They all did. What the hell was that? Oh, I told you about this book by Christopher Gaucher, yeah? Yes. It, you know, I told you it will blow your mind, right? Okay, yes, I, I could say it that. It literally just blew my okay. mind. This is unbelievable. So, I mean, I told you, like, the thing that's amazing about this guy is that um, he puts things in these contexts. Like, it can be an international context, for instance, or a comparative context. And when he does that, um, it doesn't discredit things that happened, but it just makes you see things in a new light. So, mm. you know how in 1919, Ho Chi Minh uh, went to Versailles, where the peace treaty after mm. the end of World War II, uh, World War One was being held, mm. and he tried to give um, President Truman this mm. document, right? Mm -hmm. And Truman didn't receive him, and that's a big, you know, event. Well, <clears throat> this is what Gosha writes. He said... Um, you know, Ho Chi Minh by that time had been traveling around the world. He'd come into contact with people like um, the Chinese revolutionary Zhou Enlai, um, Zhu mm, Anla, Zhou Enlai. Yeah, in, in China and in, in uh, France when he was there. Um, and he is, his English was improving. He, of course, knew French. He could sort of engage in what they call brush talks. Mm. Um, Book time, how does he dam? How does he? Yeah, in, in, with Chinese. Um, and so, yes, he went to Versailles, but um, before he submitted his document, Korean nationalists submitted their petition to the conference on 12 May. Mm. The Algerian nationalist Amir Khaled submitted one to Wilson on 23 May. Mm. Then, Gosha says, inspired by all of this, Ho Chi Minh arrived in Paris in June and joined immediately uh, with Fan Van Jung and I don't know this guy's name, uh, oh, Nguyen Tae Jun, uh, to submit a Vietnamese petition. And so he says, Ho Chi Minh did not write the famous 1919, you know, document alone. They okay. all did. Oh. Isn't that amazing? Am I you? Oh, wait, see, I told you, this book blows your mind, you know? So, you know, I Liam Kelly? no, but there's more stuff like this. It just goes on and on. So <laughs> okay. the whole, um, okay, so the 1945 August Revolution, of course, we know that Ho Chi Minh had to do a lot of things, you know, a lot of kind of, uh, there are a lot of sort of decisions he had to make to get everything into in place and all of that. And so that's not really new information. Of course, we know that. But the way that Gosha presents it is that, um, you know, he really, you know, he really, he really, it's like, instead of, you know, he really, it's like you're standing, instead of looking back and creating a narrative to show um, that only focuses on, like, what Ho Chi Minh did, it's as if he goes through time and shows you at every moment what the options were, and then takes you a little further in time and shows you how, like, okay, well, this option fell out and this thing changed, so you see it really as this, you know, move forward of a constantly changing, um, you know, world and environment, which sometimes works in Ho Chi Minh's favor and other times, you know, doesn't. Mm -hmm. But basically the result of it is, is you see all of these different things that came uh, into place that enabled something like the August Revolution. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know, discredit the actions of human beings but it just, it shows how contingent historical events are, how they rely on so many mm. things that are beyond the control of individual, you know, humans. Right. So, for instance, mm. um, yeah. uh, okay, so, you know, he sets it up by saying that in 1934, Ho Chi Minh left the Hong Kong prison that he was in, went back to the Soviet Union, 
And that basically left um, radicals and young revolutionaries in Vietnam to al align themselves with Nguyen Anh Ninh in the South. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's one thing that, you know, down the line somehow, um, you know, would have to change for the August Revolution to take place. And one of the things that starts to change is something beyond anyone's control in Vietnam, and that is the decisions of the Japanese and Germans to expand mm -hmm. and go to war right. in World um, War II, right. which, um, you know, what does he say here? Um, faced with Japanese invasion in December 1936, mm -hmm. Chinese communist and nationalist created their second united front and then he says that Stalin backed this and Ho Chi Minh benefited directly from it. Oh! Oh! Wow. Oh my God, I tucked in my shirt. What the heck? Wait, these are your clothes. Oh man. Oh, come on! I told you this book. It's just mind blowing. Yeah, so, you know. Gosh, uh, what have you done to us? So, of course, we know that, like, Ho Chi Minh mm. went to China so because. Angry. Um, you know, to, uh, I think really to kind of report on what was going there with the mm. alliance, right? But again, if the Japanese had not invaded and the, the communist and the nationalists in China, therefore, would never have had a reason to form a, a united front together. Stalin would never have seen the need to send Ho Chi Minh to figure out what was going there. You know, these are all things that were beyond the control of anyone in Vietnam, but they're essential to, you know, the kind of... Things, you know, the, the succession of events that happen that mm. eventually lead to, um, you know, the August Revolution, which is really, really fascinating. Uh, but then he talks about things that happened inside Vietnam uh, that, again, you know, really aren't anything that revolutionaries do, but are things that the French do, which ultimately then has an effect on um, Ho Chi Minh and his followers. So the French decision to outlaw communism in France and Indochina in September 1939, forced the Indochinese Communist Party to go underground. Uh, many members ended up in prison, but then there was an uprising in Cochin, China in 1940 that the mm. French crushed, which at that point, that's really the sort of the communist uh, stronghold in oh, Vietnam. Moment. Right, mm. right? And so, you know, any, if we think back in time, you know, if you were like Ho Chi Minh, thinking of what to do, well, somehow you would have had to get the support of people in the South, as that's really where kind of the main sort of, uh, uh, in, oh, where yeah. most of the radicals mm -hmm. and revolutionaries mm -hmm. were. But the French crushed, you know, this uprising and in so doing, transferred the party's center of gravity northwards okay. to mm -hmm. clandestine bases in Tonkin, led by um, Zheng Jin, and in Southern China, led by Ho Chi Minh. Mm -hmm. Oh, jeez. Oh, wow. Ay, ay, ay. That's another oh, one. Ooh. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've always read about, you know, oh, the uprising I'm... in the South and the French put it down. But then I never really thought about, you know, the fact that that would sort of move the center of gravity of the Vietnamese North communist world. world to the North. Mm. Ho Chi Minh's kind of moving, you know, southward from China into there. And so that, you know, totally fits. Um, and which, which also, you know, there's, there are um, Vietnamese nationalists who are also in southern China. There's a big group there who um, are trying to get the support of the Chinese Nationalist Party. So actually, all these happened like in the early 40s, right? Yeah, right, okay. yeah. Right at the start that. of the war, right? Mm. And so, you know, he says, so, so here's something that, you know, um, is like a conscious decision that Ho Chi Minh makes that is important. Um, but it also, you know, it relates to other people not making the same decision. He says, where the non-communist Vietnamese parties in southern China erred massively, so made a massive mistake, was in their refusal to transfer their national front to Vietnam. Mm. By failing to do so, they allowed the Viet Minh to organize bases and mobilize people in upland areas of Vietnam mm. and the Delta for four years. Mm. So, you know, the French crushing the communists in the south moves the center of gravity to the north. And Vietnamese nationalists in China's decision, for whatever reason, not to head to Vietnam, mm. opens a space for Ho Chi Minh, who does make that decision. And, um, mm. you know, mm. you've just got all of um, uh, these, these things, these things happening. Yeah. 
Um, but the, here's a really cool one. So this is one I didn't think of. So that's the Viet Minh there he's talking about, right? And they were, he, that group was formed in, do you know when? Uh, 19 May 1941. 41. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is a change from focusing on international communism to national liberation, yes. okay, which mm -hmm. is what the Soviet Union did not um, support, support at that time. Mm -hmm. They had this organization, the Comintern, mm -hmm. which was trying to bring out, you know, communist revolution around the world. Mm -hmm. So in May 1941, Ho Chi Minh makes a decision to form this different organization, the Viet Minh, which was about um, national, national liberation, liber, liber, national liberation. liberation, yeah, which could include collaborating with nationalists, right? Yes, okay, yes, yeah. and uh, then he, Gosha says, whether he predicted it or not, meaning whether Ho Chi Minh predicted it or mm. not, the German of an invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, mm. May, June, one month later, right. uh, only strengthened Ho Chi Minh's hand against any who might have doubted his insistence on a nationalist front. Right. The dissolution of the Comintern in 1943 and the Soviet Union's life and death struggle against the Nazis, the Nazis ensured that there would be no direct interference from Moscow mm. or its Vietnamese allies to Ho Chi Minh's rise to the top of the party. <laughs> I got my shirt back. Ooh, okay. What happened to my buns? <clears throat> oh, those are cute. Yeah, you're looking good. Okay. Uh, what happened to my buns? In any case, yeah, that, that's cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, like, so these are things beyond anyone's control, but then they have an influence. Because, you know, I know there was, there was so much um, sort of uh, debate within communist parties around the world and competition for power, mm -hmm. right? And so yes. if you're not in line with, say, the Comintern's policy, mm -hmm. That's something someone could use against you. But mm. just as Ho Chi Minh makes this decision to do something that's different from Soviet, you know, official policy, mm. the Soviet's official policy falls to pieces, basically, and changes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, so that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. I told you, this book is amazing. You know, I mean, so <clears throat> it's, you know, in some cases, there's new information, like the stuff about Ho Chi Minh presenting his petition at Versailles to, to Wilson. I th mm. you think I said Truman before, yeah. And yeah, there's details there from comparative history that I didn't know. Mm. The stuff about the August Revolution, I mean, that's all basically stuff that's been written about before. Mm. But the way he presents it by showing, you know, just how contingent everything was and how you know, they're just things happening in different places by different people, which they might not have a, sometimes they have a direct impact, sometimes they don't, but it's really the combination. Sometimes quite arbitrary, right? Yeah, I mean, but if, you know, you know, but it, it doesn't mean that uh, like Ho Chi Minh didn't do anything. It's, I've lost my page here, but basically, you know, he totally sees the guy as someone who's really intelligent, making the right decisions, at the right time in the right place but he really shows how the place and time was constantly changing and just you know how many things came together for him to be able to make the right decisions at the right place at the right time you know it's pretty amazing so actually so far I've seen that there has been a lot of emphasis on the politics of place and time uh -huh. but it looks like what my mean could be a lot more subtle and sophisticated yeah. than the mainstream meaning associated with the term politics. Yeah, sure. I yeah. don't know if it makes any sense. It does, yeah. And I think he's, you know, this is the sophistication right here. It totally mm. captures it. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's a great book and, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's it's a it's a it's a mind blowing book. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's this is the British version, the Penguin History of Modern Vietnam. There's an American version by uh, Christopher Gosha. It'll blow your mind. <laughs>